when I realized uh, a couple of weeks ago that I have the, uh, the daytime equivalent of the graveyard uh, shift, uh, I mean, trying to talk to anybody between three and five is, is quite the, the, the task. I realized that I'm going to have to uh, inject a little bit of what might be called a kind of motivational dimension to this. So, uh, you know, I just, I was grooving on the Wissenschaft sort of scholarship that we got both from Father Silvio and uh, His Grace uh, today. Um, all I can tell you is that your neurons may not be as excited about the kind of Wissenschaft hardcore scholarship, but whatever it takes to keep you up at this point in the afternoon, I'm going to be doing. So we've got some, some slides, got some visuals, and then there's a, you know, a little bit of, uh, as, as, I, as I said, kind of motivational stuff. So let's begin. Um, I decided the moment I, I heard this topic, I actually, uh, what immediately came to mind was the title of a book by the eminent uh, rabbi, Abraham Heschel, uh, which I think is, I, just, I, just, I, I think I've paraphrased the title, but it's uh, God in Search of Man. Okay, you can tell it was written in the 50s or 60s, you know, because they're still using that, that kind of language, which I find entirely acceptable. But anyway, God's Search for Man. And so about half of what I'm going to be talking about before I get into our searching for the sacred actually involves the Holy Ones searching for us. And in fact, before I get too far ahead of myself, here's actually where I'm headed in this talk. So uh, I want to turn the search on its head. The sacred actually seeks us. So I'll give you a couple of uh, scriptural quotations, a couple of liturgical citations, patristic quotations, and then several images. Uh, and then I think it's very important. Uh, I mean, let's, let's put it this way. I don't think anybody in this room needs any convincing that God is searching for us, right? I mean, all of you are god here in church-going people, okay? The, the question is, why isn't that something that's readily apparent to more people? And by the way, why is it that at a kind of operative level, we frequently, I mean, let's face it, uh, we may be church-going, uh, you know, baptized Christians, etc., but it's not as if the fact that God is searching for us is always something that we immediately resonate with. So there's a predicament we're in, where, we're, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, uh, subconscious div, uh, aspect of our um, of our nature that prevents us from appreciating that all the time, and that's something that we need to to uh, come to terms with if we're going to appreciate the fact that God is searching for us, and then stimulate us to search for the sacred, to to search for the Holy One. So. Um, that's uh, Roman numeral one, uh, Arabic number three, which is how we ended up in our predicament of forgetfulness, which is the opposite of anamnesis. For those of you who don't have such a facility with, with Greek, anamnesis is simply a way of saying effectual memorial. It's, it's memorializing that brings that which is remembered, okay? And it's actually a translation of the Hebrew term zikaron. I had to throw that in, uh, in Father Silvio and, and in Bishop's uh, presence here. Um, so this whole dimension of anamnesis and, and the problem of the, 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 the modern and postmodern turn to the subject is something that I'll explain to you. Don't get too worried about that yet. And then I want to get us back on our feet, as it were. In other words, uh, let's face it, you did organize a conference entitled searching for the sacred. So we're going to you know, discuss that also, not just how the sacred is seeking us. And uh, so I've written there, you know, we're going to get back on our feet after me having turned the topic on its head. And yes, we do need to do some running in the search after all. And I want to focus um, in number two and three on two areas that frequently get neglected. And by the way, I'm sure uh, as, as I proceed with this, you'll realize how kind of um, uh, provisionally subjective this is. I enjoy talking when I don't have to do the same presentation twice. 
And what ends up inevitably happening is that whatever is kind of really dominant in my mind at the time is what I end up sharing with the audience, provided, of course, it somehow fits into the topic. So when I'm done with this, hopefully you will point to about a thousand other things that I could have dealt with. But these two dimensions here, this idea of breathing and how it fits within the Christian, especially ascetical and liturgical tradition, as an act of communion with God's own breath. That's one thing I want to focus on, especially in the context of liturgical prayer. And then I want to talk about our stomachs, okay? Um, and then finally, I'm going to make a connection uh, between liturgy and life, because ultimately, of course, this is all about life. Uh, you know, Shemaimon was, was uh, the most brilliant expositor of this idea that ultimately liturgy is not about liturgy, it's, it's, it's about life. You know? and, if you, and if a liturgist is not making that connection, then he or she is doing something fundamentally wrong. Okay? Which is why, by the way, a lot of people don't realize this. Um, Matushka Yuliana Shemaimon herself said to me once, my husband never considered himself a liturgist. He said, I'm not a liturgist. Because, of course, he was thinking of people like you know, Dmitrievsky who were sitting there in, in archives with manuscripts, etc. Et but, of course, as I told her, I said, okay, whatever he thought, he's still the greatest liturgist of the 20th century, be, precisely because through his writings, you know, the liturgy really comes to life. I mean, it takes on meaning. Most people can't, have never heard of Dmitrievsky. Everybody, including you know, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Pentecostals, have heard of Shemaimon. So that's the, the, the very brief third section that I get into, liturgy and life sanctifying the profane. So very quickly through some parts of this uh, first section, I've almost um, dealt with this. Authentic theology and spirituality is bound to be paradoxical and antinomic. If it's, if it's not antinomic, it ain't orthodox, okay? Antinomy is foundational. So why should this be any different as we discuss the search for the sacred? The living God frequently turns a thing on its head. That's how you know he's alive. If you're not being turned on your head every time that you know, you're opening the scriptures, every time you're coming to church, every time you're, you're, you're opening your heart in prayer, well, not every, okay, it may not happen all the time, but if you're not open to that, then chances are you're dealing with an idol, okay, a dead God, all right? So, um, the scriptures provide us with all sorts of references to God searching for us, but this is just, this is just stuff that you know, popped to mind immediately without me doing any kind of you know, exegetical work. Two things that just immediately come to mind, Genesis 3, 8, 9, and notice the Orthodox Study Bible translation, which I find very, very fascinating here. And I looked at the Greek, and it, uh, this, this is quite uh, acceptable. Uh, in any case, I think it's fascinating. Uh, Adam and his wife hid themselves within the tree and mesotuxilu, okay, with, uh, within the tree in the middle of the garden from the presence of the Lord God. So the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Adam, where are you? You know, we always say, we're, we're always talking about the fact how uh, people are praying and they're always saying, oh, God, you know, where are you? Where were you? Well, this is God saying, hey, you know, where are you? You know, I'm, I'm looking for you. You've fallen. I'm in search of you. And then, of course, uh, 1 John 4.10, we have that beautiful quotation, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. A, a, um, a Eucharistic prayer, uh, a liturgical text here, uh, all the clergy here, and if you're a good lady following along, well, actually, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be required to follow along in a book, because liturgy is not a book. Hopefully, you're actually hearing the, the anaphora aloud. If you're not, then you can go home and read the anaphora. In any, any case, this is something that the presider at the Eucharist in the, in the, in the Byzantine tradition uh, reads. Um, uh, this is right before the, the Holy, Holy, Holy. You did not cease doing everything. This, of course, is addressing the Father. You did not cease doing everything until you led, you led us to heaven and granted us your future kingdom. And then finally, we've got this beautiful quotation here. So you see we've got stuff from the, um, the Bible uh, and an Aphra and this uh, quotation from the Dogmaticon. It's a concluding composition for a set of compositions that sung uh, at Vespers on Saturday night. It's also done on, on Friday night at the end of 
a, 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 tone of, uh, a cycle of tones. Uh, this is a, a gorgeous passage, uh, if I may be allowed to evaluate the, the Byzantine liturgical tradition. Uh, to refashion his own image, corrupted by passions, Christ sought the lost sheep wandering on the mountain. Christ sought the lost sheep and laid it on his shoulders that he might bring it to his father and by his own will unite it to the heavenly powers. And we've got uh, two, uh, I think, very striking images. This is one that you've probably seen rather often. This one, I just found this about three, four days ago on the internet, and I love it because, let's see. See that guy there? That's me probably about half of my life, uh, especially between six and eight in the morning. Uh, I mean, this, just, listen, just look at that. I mean, this, you know, so you've got this virile, powerful, dynamic Christ who's taking this rather languid individual who's just kind of slumped there. Uh, it's Christ who's taking him and putting him on his shoulders. Now, this is a, a very important passage. Now, if you're thinking in purely linear terms, you will, well, let's put it this way. I think Kavanaugh here is thinking in slightly too linear terms, but this is a good antidote to a lot of the thinking that's out there. Let me, let me read this quotation, especially for the benefit of our radio audience. Aidan Kavanaugh, uh, he was a Benedictine, but he worshiped uh, in, in the Melkite tradition. Uh, you know, with people like Schmemann, he is, is one of the great liturgical theologians of the 20th century. Uh, and I quote him, Christians do not worship because they believe. Now, if you're thinking in purely linear terms, you're going to say, well, hold it. You know, it, it's, it's really both and. And so keeping in mind that you need the other side of the antinomy, what Kavanaugh is saying here is nonetheless very, very legitimate. Christians do not worship because they believe. They believe because the one in whose gift faith lies is regularly met in the act of communal worship, not because the assembly conjures up God, but because the initiative lies with the God who has promised to be there. Okay. So it's a kind of metaphysics in reverse. You know, there's that uh, adage, uh, do I believe that Christ is present in, or the other way around, do I bow before the Eucharistic chalice because I believe that Christ is present, or do I believe because for so many decades of my life I have been bowing before the Eucharistic chalice? The answer is, of course, both. What's tended to happen uh, in a post-Enlightenment era is that we tend to exclusively think of inward going out. And so there's a, okay, but believe, believe, I, I gotta, okay, and now, o only then am I going to bow. Well, we don't realize that you need to regularly engage in a particular kind of muscular activity to, in fact, influence that interiority. So it's the regular practice of bowing even when I don't feel like bowing that increases my faith, you know? So it's that you know, that to and fro, you know, and any time you get anybody who's trying to put too much emphasis on one or the other, in other words, too much emphasis on the exterior versus the interior, too much emphasis on the interior versus the exterior, you're going to run into problems. I tell my students the only time that the body and soul are separated is at the funeral, you know, when somebody's dead. So anybody who likes to do that in terms of their spirituality is talking about a dead end. So it's always, you know, it's always the two together, inseparably. Anytime that we separate the two, it's, it's purely for the purposes of abstraction. Certainly the biblical anthropology is profoundly psychosomatic, and that's certainly the orthodox tradition, a profound uh, stress on the human person as a psychosomatic whole. And that comes out in, in the way we worship, that some people find very, you know, odd, but... Um, you know, we've got it right, and they got it wrong, unfortunately. Um, I guess we can go home. Yeah, we can go home now. That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, provided you paid your $30. Uh, so here are uh, two more passages that deal with this thing of, you know, God coming towards us. Um, for your money, you're not going to get a better successor 
to Father Alexander Schmemann, then Professor David Fagerberg at Notre Dame University. Now, he's actually a Catholic, but that's the guy who gets the standing ovation at the conference on Schmemann at St. Vladimir Seminary. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. I mean, the people who you know, had studied under Schmemann, uh, you know, the, the, the place was packed. He spoke about Schmemann's liturgical vision, and, and you know, he's, he's the only one that actually got a standing ovation because he's really mastered his thinking. Anyway, his latest book, which just came out a month, uh, no, two months ago, is entitled On Liturgical Asceticism. And Father Andrew Louth, who is you know, with people like Bishop Kalistos Ware and Aziziulis, among the, the greatest living Orthodox theologians today, Louth. Uh, is, is, a, um, is, a, is a real fan of this book. He's, he's written a beautiful endorsement. Anyway, David Fagerberg writes the following. The highest aim for Christianity is not ascetic detachment from the natural life, but it's hallowing and purification. But in order to purify it, one must in the first instance be pure from it. The purpose of Christianity is not to destroy earthly life, but, and this is the crucial but, but to raise it towards God who comes down to meet it. So I'm still in that first section where I'm talking about, you know, God in search of us. And then uh, Fagerberg here is quoting uh, Father Andrew Louth. He says, in Andrew Louth's words, to come to know God is a matter of experience, not speculation, which of course is crucial in our day and age when you get a lot of people who are interested in reading spirituality, but try to get them into church. Because getting into the church involves an act of commitment. Okay, and that's what we have real problems with today, right? So he's saying it's, it's first and foremost a matter of experience, not speculation. And he says, for a Christian to come to know God is to respond to a God who has made himself known. And we get some uh, beautiful uh, patristic reflection here. This is quoted by Fagerberg um, in... Uh, in that book on liturgical asceticism. And I had to throw this in because I knew that His Grace Bishop Alexander is going to be here. And Bishop Alexander has done more to rehabilitate St. Dionysius the Areopagite in, in, in our age than, than, than a lot of, uh, of other scholars. Um, this is what Fagerberg writes, um, basing himself on the theology, some of the insights of Maximus the Confessor and Dionysius the Areopagite. He says, Maximus the Confessor interprets Dionysius, and I wish I could give you the full you know, quotation, but anyway, he says, you're getting the Coles Notes version here, uh, interprets Dionysius to be saying that the divine is an erotic force that goes out of itself to rouse creation by an attracting, attractive, love. One must, also, one must also in the name of truth be bold enough, and this by the way is Maximus himself, this is Maximus himself now writing in the, uh, the, his fifth century on love, one must also in the name of truth be bold enough to affirm that the cause, with capital C, that the cause of all things through the beauty, goodness, and profusion of his intense love for everything goes out of himself in his providential care for the whole of creation, this ecstasis, by means of the supercentral power of ecstasy, and spellbound, as it were, by goodness, love, and longing. So you've got God longing, longing for us. Okay? He, God, relinquishes his utter transcendence in order to dwell in all things while yet remaining within himself. Hence, those skilled in divine matters call him a zealous and exemplary lover because of the intensity of his blessed longing for all things and because he rouses others to imitate his own intense desire. So you have this kind of divine eros. Now, you heard love. Fuzzy, nice, feel-good sort of word and theme. Nobody's going to object to this, right? This is cool. Father Peter is on to, you know, okay, God is just so madly in love with us. He's passionate. He's out there trying to you know, just embrace us. You know, what could be wrong with that? Well, the only thing wrong with that in our narcissistic age is that it, of course, ends up being misunderstood, which is why, you know, Maximus, for example, uh, who's very big on apophatic theology, says, watch it. 
even when you say God is love, you immediately have to say God is not love. Now, can you imagine saying to somebody, God's not love? What what are you talking about? It says in the scriptures. And of course, Maximus says what? Well, he's not love in any way that you could ever understand this. And so the caveat that I want to immediately introduce here, having introduced this nice warm and fuzzy notion that, you know, God is passionate about embracing us, it's a caveat that comes from uh, an amazing work by um, uh, Father Pavel Florensky. How many of you have ever heard of Pavel Florensky? This is a guy that, that you hopefully will become better known. He had some, he's got some pretty idiosyncratic stuff. I mean, he died as a martyr of the church. They finally found out you know, when he was executed. For years, they didn't know. But um, he was an Orthodox priest in Russia, a polymath. He's a physicist, a uh, guy who uh, you know, was, was very much into uh, symbolist art, uh, just, just a, a man of you know, uh, brilliant abilities. He wrote, uh, well, actually, he, he started a series of lectures in 1918, which continued until 22. They remained in manuscript form until the 1970s. The uh, journal, the Theological Journal of the Moscow Theological Academy, finally published uh, those lectures um, uh, in Russian. Philosophia Kulta, it's called, the philosophy of cult, which is basically the philosophy of, of, of worship. And these, I mean, the, the, the tract goes on for about, oh, maybe 140 pages. These words are the very first words of this tract where he's talking about liturgy and sacraments, and there's a whole complex of, of, of worship, you know, in the Orthodox tradition. He said, Lubov, 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 love, 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 and again, love. This mystical word repeated out infinitum by an infinite number of people who have not even come near the threshold of authentic religion has lost all meaning. So that's the very first sentence of his work. And this, I think, is really neat. This is, I think, the beginning of the third sentence. The real purpose of my talks, this is Florensky speaking in 1918, the real purpose of my talks is not to bring you closer to the sacramental mysteries, but rather to distance you from them. You, you heard uh, Bishop Alexander last night talking about the you know, mysterium tremendum, you know, the, the awe, you know, it's the degree of frictos, you know, it's the, 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 the mysteries are, are fricti. They make your, you know, your, uh, your hair stand on end. That's literally what frictos means, okay? So he's saying, the real person I talks is not to bring you closer to the sacrament of the mysteries, but rather to distance you from them. We will begin to understand that the mysteries of the cult, in other words, you know, the, the, the mysteries, the sacramental mysteries of the liturgical life of the church, are not, as they seem to many, rolling hills where we play, but rather mountain peaks hanging over the clouds and holding up the heavens. Familiarity with the cult, in other words, with, with worship, should henceforth be replaced by the fear of God. If this happens, then our goal in these lectures will have been achieved. Now, 60 years ago, this may not be something that I would have wanted to stress, right? I mean, some of us still bear the scars of a kind of uh, over-authoritarian, disciplinarian sort of, uh, you know, spanking religion. You know, well, we've gone from, from that extreme to the extreme today where, I mean, who was it? Uh, you know, you were speaking earlier, Father, about the fact that, you know, somebody can walk into a church and have no sense that, you know, they shouldn't be kind of lying down on the pew or something like that, you know, sticking their gum, uh, their chewing gum, you know, uh, in, in, in strange places in the church or whatever, you know, chewing gum in general. So this, I think, is in a very, very... Uh, prophetic sort of statement on the part of Florensky, and we need to be put back in touch with that tremendum because, and it's not about evoking a destructive fear, the fear that overwhelms us when we're, in, when we're in touch with the divine, it's a salvific fear that has to do with the fact that all of our categories have been blown to smithereens. It's all blown to smithereens, and I'm just like, you know, I'm, 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 shocked in an overwhelmingly beautiful way about what is confronting me. Okay? So the real God, the living one, will never conform to our expectations, whether good or bad. God has promised to be there. God has promised to be there in these sacramental liturgical realities. But it is he who comes 
not our fabrication of him. So it's, um, it's very interesting. I, I have a little kind of personal note here. Let me try to get this off my thing here. Um, I, Peter Galazza, that's not Patologia Greca. Although I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm very happy that I have those initials. Anyway, I, Peter Galazza, have come to the conclusion that my work as a liturgist will only amount to something if I can get my students to be in church no matter how bad, how uninspiring, how dull the service. In other words, if Christ has promised to be there, who am I to play hard to get? You know, continuing with the, the lover kind of dynamic. Okay, now, if you take that linear logic to its linearly logical conclusion, you're going to then end up with folks who say, wow, you know, kind of no matter how we do it, you know, God, God's here, you know, that ex opere operato approach which is the bane of all liturgizing, right? So again, it's a matter of balancing the two. In other words, we have to be convinced that something is happening there, and it's my duty, my obligation, my salvation to be there, whether it's really exciting, whether it's nice or not. And yet at the same time, those of us especially who are in the ministry, doing the liturgical ministry, have to serve have to sing, have to act, as if it were just the opposite. In other words, as if it really did depend on me articulating every word, me producing the most beautiful sounds as a, as a choir, as a member of the choir, me caring for the appointments in church being as aesthetically marvelous as they can be. But at the end of the day, it is about Christ having promised to be there. And so us saying, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be too good today, but I'm there anyway. Why? Because this is not just an emanation of my consciousness. And we're going to get into this. So this is now number two, the whole problem of our predicament. And I want to begin with a, um, a personal story it illustrates a kind of civilizational crisis. So almost 25 years ago, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but I was lying in bed during the Christmas break. It was probably as late as, I don't know, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was, uh, you know, I'd had a horrible experience. And I'm praying, you know, I mean, I first was exposed to the Jesus prayer when I was, uh, what, I think 11 years old. And I'm praying. And at one moment, as I was lying there, I was overwhelmed by the sense that there was actually someone on the other end. In other words, that my prayer was actually being received, being heard by someone. Now you can say to yourself, I mean, that is so obvious. Why should that have been revelatory? Well, what was revelatory for, that, for me at that moment was the extent to which I had been using even the Jesus prayer as a way to, you know, do self-affirmation, to make myself calm, you know, to get in tune with, you know, what's, what's in my environment, this, you know, kind of, you know, all these ideas of a mindfulness, etc. And it became obvious to me that even though I had never for a moment doubted the fact that God exists, God is listening, God is, uh, you know, hopefully inspiring my prayer. God is certainly receiving my prayer. The fact is, at an operative subconscious level, there was a way in which my talking to God was still very much a projection of me. It was basically me just emanating kind of, you know, conscious vibes without a total full awareness of that objective, dynamic, powerful reality of God's presence. Okay? Now where does that come from? Well it all starts going downhill 
when you start believing that you are because you think. This is, you remember I mentioned earlier the turn to the subject? That's a classical sort of topos, as, as they say in, in philosophy. The turn to the subject is what happens when Descartes convinces the world that we know that we exist because we think. You know, now I'm not going to give you philosophy 101, you know, how Descartes comes to this conviction, you know, uh, I am because I think, you know, cogito, or sorry, I think, therefore I am, sorry, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. But what you have is a, is, is a tendency in Western philosophy that takes off at that period. It reaches another high point in, in Kant, and then it just continues on. And what happens is that the fundamental reality of revelation itself becomes sidelined. Okay? And I'm going to give you, um, well, before I give you some really high-powered Wissenschaft sort of quotations, what I think you need to be aware of is in the Christian East, uh, we fortunately, if we can consider ourselves, this is the whole problem, kind of we are and we aren't the Christian East. In other words, we're inheritors of this amazing tradition, but believe me, we're very much the West, okay? Everything we imbibe is, is, is the West in, in various categories, for better or for worse. Sometimes it's, thank God, I mean, it's, it's, it's for better. Sometimes it's for worse. But in any case, the Christian East has experienced the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment only derivatively. Those three crucial societal, civilizational shifts are things that happen in the West, and we, just, in the Christian East, we kind of ended up just getting the, the reverberations of that. And one of the dimensions of that is this turn to the subject, which kind of influences us here in, in the West, but fortunately hasn't, for example, influenced our liturgical tradition. It's influenced the way sometimes we approach our liturgical tradition, but the liturgical texts derive from a, a worldview that is not impacted by this, at times, very deleterious turn to the subject. So what am I getting at here? Um, well, to help us out with this, I turn to a brilliant Protestant uh, scholar, and, uh, and um, as I write here, the following analysis is by a Protestant scholar, so I hope no one will suggest that I'm engaging in Protestant bashing. Believe me, there is so much that we can learn from you know, the, the good currents in, in, in Protestant theology, especially a lot of the uh, evangelical currents. So the scholar is, is Craig M. Gay, and the passage is from a book appropriately entitled, by the way, this is a, a marvelous book I discovered about 12 years ago, uh, The Way of the Modern, sorry, Modern, not Modern World, <laughs> or Why It's Tempting to Live as If God Doesn't Exist. So the analysis, while intellectually dense, is very much worth the effort. It describes the intellectual air that all of us breathe. So he, he writes here, and you know what, I'm going to spare this. I, I suspect that for the, the, the radio audience this may be a little bit uh, frustrating, but I'm just going to skip to the points that are crucial, the, the, the points that I've bolded here. So he writes, this is Craig M. Gay, um, in attempting to rescue the Christian faith from the criticism of pure reason, for example, Kant decided to shift theology's focus away from revealed truth. Okay. Schleiermacher, you know, a generation or two later, he's really very much the father of modern liberal uh, Western theology. Schleiermacher subsequently reduced God to a kind of necessary precondition for the possibility of inwardness. And then Feuerbach's central contention that religion in general and theology in particular is nothing but the projection of human subjectivity is simply the inverted mirror image of Kant and Schleiermacher. So in evading the naughty problem of revelation, and again, my apologies to the, the, um, the radio audience because you're not getting the, the, all of these quotations in context, you're missing some of the content here in evading the naughty problem of revelation. In other words, the idea that there is this, call it, I mean, it's, it's a bad word, but there's this objective reality. I mean, I say it's a bad word because it, you know, it's, it's not objective in the, in, in the factual way that that table is gray. I mean, it goes way beyond it. But it's objective in a sense it's really, really there, capable of encountering us, okay? 
So in evading the naughty, naughty problem of revelation, in other words, by trying to get around, say, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just bracket whether revelation actually takes place, you know, whether the reality of God is, is, a, is a dynamic reality capable of entering into interpersonal relationships, etc. Uh, by evading that naughty problem, the strategy of adducing evidence for faith from human experience only reinforced the typically modern suspicion that the Christian religion was simply the product of the human imagination. Now, nobody here believes that authentic religion, authentic Christianity, is simply the product of human imagination. But we have imbibed so much of the zeitgeist that in an operative level we tend to adduce evidence for faith from human experience in such a way that it downplays the reality of this objective presence, this divine presence coming to us. So I, I hope you sense where I'm going with this because the worst, I mean, the, the heresy of today, part, part of the, 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 you know, the, the New Age kind of uh, heretical downfall it involves the willingness to accept some kind of divine reality, but it's very much about me manipulating the divine, okay, rather, instead of me being an instrument in God's hands. Okay? And this is in part where this comes from. Okay? And it infects all of us. So... Um, the next theme that, that, um, that Craig and Gay turns to is this, this whole question of whether, in fact, God has any authority. And he says, the question modernity raises, even for Christians, is whether or not God possesses any real authority to, to define our everyday existence. And then later he says, indeed, contemporary social existence is such that we are discouraged from embracing anything beyond the belief that God might somehow be of use within the ongoing construction of private identity. Okay, so it's possible to use all sorts of spiritualities, quite frankly, liturgical experience itself, to construct this private identity. In the case, in the case of liturgy, it's a little bit more difficult because you can't be as private about liturgy. But even liturgy can succumb to some of this. So this is obviously a very far cry from the obedience of faith to which Christians are called, Romans 1.5. So I summarize, yeah, sure. We don't mind searching for the sacred, but every step of the way can end up being a construction controlled by me, okay? which means that you're not following the way um, to um, reference Acts 9-2. So... Um, here he's just talking about the impact of, of technology on some of our kind of operative philosophies. This has an impact on, on certain things that happen in liturgy. Uh, let me just summarize this section by saying the key is to approach worship as a response. In fact, Father Robert Taft frequently likes to point out that the Mother of God summarized everything that we need to know about liturgical theology when, when she said the following. The Holy One has done great things for me. Sorry. The, the, um, uh, how is it again? The Holy One has great things for me. Holy is his name. What is it? The, the, um, I'm, I'm thinking in Church Slavonic. Uh, what is it? Has done great things for him. The Mighty. No, is it the Mighty? The Mighty? What is it? This, this is really embarrassing. Edit this out on the radio. Yes, precisely. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll pay you big time, okay? I'll pay you big time. Velicius uh, Oturim Nisirin. Oh, the, the, the mighty one, the mighty. Velicius Oturim Nisirin, right. So the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name, right? So the mighty one's done something, and what do I say? Well, that's, that's really nice, you know, there's God, God is really, no, no. Holy. Is it, you know, that's my response. So it's about us responding. So the key is to approach worship as a response. If we are not responding to God, we are creating our own God. And even liturgy can, can become 
that gone. So I've got a couple of slides here. Remember I said I have to keep you awake. And besides, we're talking about liturgy. So liturgy is not a text. It's not words, first and foremost. It's, a, it's, it's life as God intended it to be in the round. So you have to get a little bit of experience of that in the round, you know, the, the visuals, etc. And these are, are some uh, slides that stress this idea of the God who comes to us. So there's a dynamic. It's very much in keeping with the quote-unquote emanations in Dionysius, where it's constantly God coming down to us. The dynamic, we tend to stress so much this, this theology of ascent, which is also there. That's the other side of the story. But the liturgy actually begins with a descent. You know, the royal door is open, and you know, here we are now. It's interesting that that's something that occurs uh, only in the second millennium. In the first millennium, in the Byzantine tradition, it very much does involve you know, procession into the church. You know? But by the second millennium, the dominant dynamic is one of the ascent from that symbolization of the heavens into our midst. In either case, this is certainly a reality of, of, of descent. By the way, all these slides and, and pictures, except for the two of them, are from... Uh, my brother's parish, uh, St. Elias Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in Brampton, Ontario. And I, I need to, to say it first out of, of gratitude uh, for being able to get these slides, but also because my brother and I are frequently confused. But as I tell people, I'm very proud to be, to be uh, confused with my, with my brother because I think these, I mean, what he's done in this suburb of Toronto is, is just gorgeous. That's one slide. This is now another reality of a response. So you've got the, you know, the yelling out of, of the greeting. And this is actually the congregation singing. They don't have, they don't use a choir per se. So the next step in the downfall, I'm talking about the, the downfall of allowing the turn to the subject to become dominant. The next step in the downfall is that we start engineering and planning worship rather than the liturgical tradition guiding us. Father Robert Taft likes to laugh at the idea of a liturgical planning committee. He says the liturgy plans us. We don't plan the liturgy. Okay. And this now is continuing um, with this theme of our responding and what needs to be happening psychologically and certainly liturgically and even in terms of space for that response to be the kind of response that's in keeping with authentic Christian tradition. So this is, uh, this is me speaking here, uh, uh, quoting, of course, uh, referencing Schmemann. So secularism is the negation of worship. Secularism is the inability and refusal to accept the world's enchantment by the divine. Whenever you hear that term, what you want to be thinking about the fact is that our forebears, you know, people like my, well, even my parents, not just my grandparents, were able to look at an ordinary loaf of bread and treat it as an amazing gift from God. They were incapable of, for example, even cutting it just for ordinary consumption without first making the sign of the cross over it with a knife. They would go into a forest and, and look at what they saw and you know, experience that as, as a form of communion with God. They had this kind of visceral, operative sense that all of this is a gift from God. Well, we don't have that same sense of enchantment. The, the tragedy is that because we kind of gave that up with the modern zeitgeist, who picked it up? The New Age people, you know? 
So they've got, they've, got, they've got an element of authentic Christian spirituality, but like most heresies, you take a part of the authentic tradition and then you rework it or warp it, okay? So anyway, um, secularism is the inability and refusal to address God in our very midst in a manner that evokes his presence, or more correctly, witnesses to the credibility of belief in that presence. Authentic liturgical worship enacts a theocentrism that ideally generates a concomitant lifestyle. Now, in the Eastern Christian traditions, and this, by the way, stands for all of them. This is a kind of dividing point between all East and, and all West. I think the Maronites are the only ones uh, that have, sorry, the Cyril Malabars in many cases, but none of those, those are you know, newer adaptations. Everybody else you know, faces, faces the East. You know, ad orientum, ad altare, for, for their um, liturgical worship. In the Eastern Christian traditions, the very stance of the clergy and congregation reveal an orientation toward the beyond. And the church's icon screen compels us not only to fix our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because there's something behind the iconostas. You know, you're constantly being, being um, you know, your, your, your imagination, your, your sense of, of longing for the divine is being titillated. It's like, you know, children do this really well, which is why our worship is really, you know, I mean, it's perfect for kids. It's, you know, authentic Eastern Christian worship is a child's world in the best sense. So the icon screen compels us not only to fix our eyes on what is seen but on what is unseen for what is seen is temporary what is unseen is eternal to quote 2 Corinthians 4.18 the enclosing of the Holy of Holies with an icon screen moves us to hope for what we do not yet have to wait for it patiently to wait for the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband Revelation 21 2 and I, I have a picture I couldn't find it on my, my computer you know when you've got a properly appointed church dome and the dome is a large one that kind of embraces the worshiping community you really have this sense that it's that holy city the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and there are frequently in churches of the Byzantine uh, tradition this passage from Revelation cited uh, around it's written around you know the um, uh, it's not the corona but whatever it's called the uh, the um, uh, the the wall of that central dome. So this stance ideally generates a hermeneutic of suspicion towards our own consciousness. Ideally, it reverses the notion that transcendence emanates from us. So all of you have heard that expression, a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? If you haven't, count your blessings, okay? <laughs> Hermeneutic of suspicion is what we are told to apply to all the holy things. I mean, this, this is what's happened in modern scholarship. The amazing thing, you know, I, 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 anytime you know, you're having problems, just turn it, turn it on his head and say, well, hold it. I'd like to apply hermeneutic of suspicion to my own consciousness. I'd like to apply the hermeneutic of suspicion to the hermeneuticists of suspicion, okay? You know? <laughs> What we need to constantly be doing is, is being suspicious of this consciousness that wants to turn transcendence into an emanation from us. Okay? This, uh, this is another Ukrainian Catholic church. This is the Cathedral of St. Sophia outside Rome on, on Via Bocea. Uh, fortunately, they removed the, the chairs for, for this picture. The, the chairs just don't fit. Um, there's a, I have this here because of the, the beautiful icon screen, which you can see. It's all mosaics. That's an image of, of Sophia there in the apse, the divine wisdom. And this then, this involves, now this, um, I should prep this. This is here, by the way, uh, the one thing that is recycled in this presentation is some of the videos. I couldn't get the, the videos that I wanted, but I, I felt that this is a, uh, a video from St. Elias Parish that nonetheless portrays this dynamic of response. So in many of the Western Ukrainian traditions, what happens is when the gospel is brought out at the little entrance, the people come forward to kiss it. 
Okay, so there's a procession of veneration to the gospel, the idea being that before we hear the word proclaimed, we have to have the proper attitude, which is one of reverence. Because, of course, what is being proclaimed is not just more information, more text, whatever. It's the word of God. So uh, this illustrates this dynamic of, of response to what is being brought forth, being brought down. This is, this is congregational singing, if you can believe it. My brother was a music teacher, so this is it's why. You know. So the Eastern liturgical traditions have also managed to avoid some of the deleterious side effects of this post-Cartesian turn to the subject, which have made their way into certain other liturgical traditions. Generally, the hymnography and prayers resist the modern tendency to extol what we are doing and feeling in preference for a thou-centered focus on what God has done and is doing. You could do 20 doctoral dissertations just illustrating how the Cartesian turn to the subject influenced developments in liturgy, in worship, certainly throughout the Western world, and it has its, can have its impact sometimes on things in, in uh, Orthodox or, or, or Byzantine Catholic worship. Now, <clears throat> What do I have until, uh, I should finish at 4 o'clock, right? Okay, I'll finish it so that we have at least 20 minutes for discussion. Okay, so finding the divine in our breathing. As you know, ruach, you've heard this, or this is, you're going you're gonna to hear this eight, ten times this weekend between last night and today. Ruach is the Hebrew word for breath, spirit, wind. Think synthetically, think psychosomatically, and then think about the anavathmi, the stipendi, and what they say about the Holy Spirit being our very life. By the Holy Spirit, Every soul lives. Then think biblically. By the holy breath, by holy breathing, every soul lives. Overcome the Platonizing dichotomy and ask yourself, what is going on here if not one of the most beautiful experiences of communion with God that you can imagine? Singing and breathing divinely. Essentially, every word of an Orthodox service is chanted or otherwise sung. In addition to a myriad of other theologically significant reasons for stressing this form of vocality, there is the fact that prolonged, disciplined breathing, which is what singing is very much about. Okay? That's really what, if, if you want to be able to, to sing for six hours at Pascha, you have to learn how to breathe. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's, it's a disaster. Don't, don't even try to be a good Orthodox 
Christian worshiper involved in singing if you don't know how to breathe because it's always going, oh, no, oh, no, that was so long, etc. Well, you know, opera singers will tell you that they can sing forever because they know how to breathe, okay? <laughs> but this is not about technique. It's not about technique. This is about salvation. This is about life. This is about fundamental Christian anthropology. So there's the fact that prolonged disciplined breathing, which is what singing is very much about, potentially affects communion with God's holy breath in a manner that we moderns, possibly owing to a kind of Gnostic, Docetic, or even Cryptomanichean pneumatology, usually overlook. Okay? So pneumatology is what it's all about, right? This is the beautiful gift of Orthodox Christianity to the West, which we frequently mention, kind of lost sight of the Holy Spirit in his theology for several centuries. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but you get Roman Catholic authors themselves who will say that, yeah, kind of the Holy Spirit was the forgotten, you know, person of the Trinity for several centuries. Orthodox theology maintained a greater stress on the pneumatology, but there's a way in which we Eastern Christians can nonetheless engage in what I call here, as I say, a kind of Gnostic, Docetic, or even Crypto-Manichaean pneumatology, when we don't allow ourselves to see the connection between the Holy Spirit and breathing. It's platonic to separate the two. So imagine the sacramental power of acknowledging and enacting one's inhalation and exhalation as a means of communing with the Holy Spirit. So here's, again, this is a recycled video, but it's really cool because it's, it's, it's just got singing. It's got, and actually, you know what, before, before you press that, a little word of explanation. Um, again, this is my brother's parish. Um, they, because this is Canada, they do at least one thing in French uh, you know, every year at, at, at Pascha. What is amazing about this is that uh, 90% of the people singing aren't even francophone. They probably can't say more than, you know, uh, bonjour, uh, c'est un plaisir d'être ici, or something. Well, actually, that's too much, okay? Uh, <laughs> but once you have this stress on, on, on singing and understanding that, you know, to worship involves, it, it's, it's contagious. And so you'll, you'll see, right, people who aren't francophones singing the Paschal Torpadion in French, and again, without a conductor or anything. So it's, it's a Romanian melody, by the way. Oh, so you can't see this little girl here. Times. That's apparently a Romanian folk melody, Father. Have you ever heard that melody? I ever since I heard that, like six years ago, I, oh, I, 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 oh, I, I go into ecstasy every time I, uh, I. I must be Romanian after all. <laughs> so, the next thing I want to point about, uh, point out with regards to the, the centrality of music is that, in fact, the trichord is the best analogy of the Trinity. You know, we, we have, I, I, I'm willing to go on radio with this and say that we potentially have a heretical expression of Trinitarian theology in the Trichidion. You know what the Trichidion is, right? You've got the triple branch candlestick. The problem is that it's very easy to imagine that the three persons of the Trinity are confused, right? Because the unity involves, in the case of three flames, a potential confusion, right? Now that's, that's heresy, right? You cannot confuse the Father with the Son, the Son with the Spirit, right? Okay? How do you like that? Okay, I, I got you. I woke you up, all right? So you're all... Uh, anyway, the point is that with any symbol, there's always the danger of confusion. What is really astounding, and the reason I stress this here is because nobody, nobody ever has, has said this, and I've been saying this now for 10 years. If you sing a trichord, we're going to try this right away. Uh, of course, you can tell that I'm a, a computer disaster because I, I wrote out 
uh, a G major chord, and that's <laughs> what comes out on the on the screen there. Okay, you can't even see it, but we're gonna we're gonna try this right now. And what? Uh, well, let's try it first, and I'll explain to you why what we just did in seeing the trichord is actually the best analogy for the Trinity. Okay, keeping in mind that all analogies fall short. And the moment you make any kind of cataphatic statement, you have to step back with an apophatic statement. But anyway, let's try it now. Okay, so who's going to say, oh, it's, it's going to be try along. So I need a third of you. Oh, very good, thank you. So let's say, oh, keep, the, keep that on, keep that on. Oh, okay, over here. You are good. All right? That's amazing. That's another ploy to keep you awake. <laughs> now, that was near perfect. If it had been perfect, you would have heard a unified sound. It would have struck you as one sound, okay, not divisible, one unified sound, and yet each note in that chord had to. It must remain distinct in order for that trichord to be the trichord that it is. In other words, if you start going flat and end up going into their note, you don't have the trichord anymore and it sounds pretty horrible, okay? So imagine in the traditions that allow for trichords, and by the way, even in authentic Byzantine show, you've got the the Eson, okay, and which sometimes breaks off. They, they sometimes allow for, for three chords. Anyway, I mean, I, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to allow myself to, to say this. I think that <clears throat> uh, Slavic chant, East Slavic chant, <clears throat> is at times an improvement on his Byzantine prototypes. So uh, this may be one example, one kind of theological argument. In other words, the, the trichord as this amazingly beautiful analogy for the Trinity. So every time that you're engaged in singing this trichord, you are in fact creating an image. You're creating a, a ver a, a, an oral image of Trinitarian life. And uh, last night, Bishop Alexander appropriately uh, talked about you know, the, the Trubicon, where you know, the word is ikonizontes. We image forth. We are icons of the cherubim who sing what? the thrice holy hymn, to whom? The life-creating who? Trinity. So you got, whoa, you know, you got singing, you got chairman doing thrice holy hymn, you got, you got uh, Trinity, and sometimes it's even a trichord. Okay. So note the theology of singing that is presumed by Byzantine Slav liturgical music. A holistic commitment uh, of one's totality. That is what is presumed by this um, theology of singing. And it's an, uh, Nicholas Losky, who to my knowledge is the only, one of the, well, apparently the only theologian who has an, attempted, whether East or West, a theology of music, of church singing. Uh, and it's not surprising because, of course, within the Orthodox tradition, it is inconceivable that one would liturgize without putting a great stress on a particular approach to music. So you can imagine that if your breathing becomes sacramental, the sound that is produced when your singing is going to be different. In any case, it can frequently be a very kind of lyrical, integrated love song, uh, and Harkening back to, to the passage that I have, the Romans 12, 1, which is, uh, I implore you, my brothers, to offer your very bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your logiki latria, translated as you wish. Rational worship, spiritual worship, reasonable worship. I actually prefer integrated holistic worship. Okay, logiki latria. It's a worship that St. Paul is saying has to include every fiber of your being, which is why he says, I implore you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
So that's what we're doing in singing. So anybody who thinks that getting up you know, in church and just kind of singing and opening your mouth, even if it's, it's done very professionally, that that is, is in fact you know, authentic liturgical singing is missing something. It would be like imagining that you know, I can do a homily just by getting up and producing something that may be you know, very proficient, very correct in different ways, but it's, you know, you, we all know that that's not yet, yet a homily. And this dimension of lyricism, uh, love song, I'll never, I always tell people this, I, I was, it's kind of appropriate, because um, I was just courting my future wife at, at the time, and we walked out of a, a beautiful vigil service at, at the Rocour Parish in, in Toronto, and we were still students there. And my future wife turns to me, and the choir was just, just magnificent. You know, you still had people alive then. This is the um, mid-70s who had you know, kind of lived um, you know, through that interwar period, you know, they, they, they had that, that, that training, that sense uh, that, that derived from you know, the, the imperial days yet. And my wife turns to me, and she says, you know, that's, that's a love song to God. And that's really what good Orthodox liturgical music is all about. And that kind of dynamic, that, that kind of quality, tonality, ethos in the church music is prepared ideally with the practice of the Jesus prayer. I know a priest uh, in Winnipeg who um, every time that there was supposed to be a, a liturgy. In other words, any you know, any time he had more than just maybe the cantor and, and two, three people. In other words, if he had a crew of altar boys, you know, various other people, they would all sit down a half hour before the divine liturgy in the sacristy and do the Jesus prayer together. You know, and it's a very you know uh, an amazingly powerful way to to prepare everybody that's going to be standing at the altar. You can imagine what this would do to a, to a choir. You know. So we go from breathing to hungering, and um, there's a quotation here again, it's just the bolded section. Maximus the Confessor says, unless the mind finds something better than the passions to which it can transfer its desire, it will not be completely persuaded to disdain them. Okay? So who here enjoys fasting? Well, as, as you can see, I certainly don't, right? So trying to get people to fast, which is an integral part of liturgical experience, because one of the problems with the liturgical renewal is that it focused too much on liturgy and not enough on overall okay. spiritual <laughs> renewal, okay? But liturgical renewal doesn't work without an ascetical renewal. So what you have to do in order to actually get everything in the proper proportion is relearn or learn how to fast, which is again a very physical reality which we downplay because of our post-enlightenment idea that you know, religion is all about you know, just, just the interior. What's very interesting, and this is a, a situation all of us who are Eastern Christians and whatever, Orthodox, et cetera, we're floating on all these very nice things that I've been saying um, about the Orthodox or, or Byzantine liturgical tradition, uh, just to get us thinking about something that, that needs to be reoriented. We have lost, we have fundamentally lost the approach of the great church, which is the great church of, of Constantinople, Hagia Sophia. We have lost their approach, which existed until 1204, with regards to the weekdays of Lent and the fasting discipline. Because it's as clear as day, and by the way, this tradition was preserved at the Pachatska Lavra in Kiev right up until 1917, right up until the, the revolution. The tradition is that on all these weekdays of Lent, from Monday to Friday, in other words, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, not just Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday and Friday is Palestinian monastic practice. Having the liturgy of the presanctified gifts on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, in other words, every weekday of Lent, is in fact the authentic Byzantine Christian tradition. Now, having stated that as a matter of historical record, you're going to say, okay, big deal, what's that all about? Well, I'll never 
for, I'll never forget when uh, we, we've, you know, at our institute, we, we go through different phases and years when we have enough singers to, to do. There were years when we actually would have the liturgy that Presanctified gives every day. And what you, in other words, you know, Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, not just Wednesday and Friday. And I'll never forget the, the first time that my experience of profound hunger went from being a sense of absence to a sense of presence. In other words, the moment that I began filling the sense, that, that pain of hunger, with an effectual remembrance of Jesus Christ, whom I was going to receive in communion, you know, in, you know, in, in, in the evening, the experience of fasting became a totally different reality. Because the hunger, the pain, is then superimposed upon, it's, it's as it were replaced and displaced by an experience of fullness and fulfillment. And this, I think, is very much uh, what, what, in fact, Maximus is at. I mean, he's not talking about the liturgy of the percent of ideas, but he's talking about the mind finding something better than the passions to which it can, can transfer its desires. So you get in touch with your stomach and you say, Lord, that's where I want to be experiencing you. And by the way, if you're speaking in Church Slavonic, right? Many of you speak Church Slavonic all the time, right? You, you, certainly, you, you certainly dream in Church Slavonic, right? right? Well, if you're, if you're thinking or speaking in Church Slavonic, what's Zhivot, right? Zhivot, which is life, also ends up in later languages becoming stomach. You know, the, it's no wonder the, the Slavs have this thing with, you know, cabbage rolls and, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, pierogies, etc. You know? <laughs> so life is identified with the stomach. Now, we could all laugh at, at that, as, as we do, you know, but the fact is that there's something very profound with that because it, it, it enables us then to think about the sacramentality of eating. You know, Shemaiman says, God gives us this whole world for us to, to satiate our hunger with. And as we satiate our hunger with what God has given us, we are put in communion with God. You know, so it's not in spite of the world that we're in communion with God. It's precisely because God has given us this world. So just for those, uh, you know, I figure that we might have some people who've never seen communion in the Byzantine tradition. So this is Parish. And to conclude, and this shouldn't take me more than five minutes, one of the most uh, amazing pieces that you'll ever read on the sacraments is by a, a convert um, to, to Orthodoxy, Philip Sherard. Bishop Alexander, did you ever, did you ever meet Philip uh, Sherard? He's an amazing, he's one of the translators of, of the Philokalia. Uh, in a uh, compilation of articles produced back in 64, um, the book was entitled The Orthodox Ethos, he enunciates in an article called The, the Sacraments uh, what he calls the sacramental principle. It's very apropos for us in our discussions of you know, sacred versus profane. I really recommend the entire piece. And I quote uh, Philip Sherard here. The sacrament is not something set over against or existing outside the rest of life so that it is sacred while the rest of life and all other things are non-sacred or profane or non-sacramental. What is indicated or revealed in the sacrament is something universal. The intrinsic sanctity and spirituality of all things, what one might call their real nature. Therefore, while the way of looking at or using things may well be profane and non-sacred, the things themselves can never be. Okay? And he's dead on. And there are other pieces that, that unpack this and explain this with the necessary nuances. So the goal then is to achieve a life in which our dinner tables again become holy tables, where the Eucharistic sacrifice compels us to sacrifice for those we'd rather not be with. Okay? So the real heaven, not just its virtual surrogate, and you'll see right away why I'm talking about 
the virtual surrogates. I'm going to show you an ad from Facebook that I think says it all about where we're actually at and the surrogates that exist today for, for sacramental existence. Anyway, so the real heaven, not just its virtual surrogate, can break in and it can pull us back from escaping reality so that we can inscape into communion with reality. And remember, the really real is God. So all we need is an amnesis, effectual memorial. God's bringing into effect that which is remembered instead of amnesia. And there's a way in which so much of what surrounds us leads to an amnesia instead of an amnesis. And this, I think, the, this final quotation here that I'm, I'm going to read before uh, I show you this, this Facebook ad, which, which I'm going to then unpack very briefly. But uh, this is very apropos regarding uh, personhood uh, and the whole idea of being in communion with those around us. So um, this is... Uh, this is actually Craig M. Gay quoting Ziziulas. Uh, he says, Personhood, I'm, as you can see, I'm reading the bold print. Personhood implies the openness of being, and even more than that, the ecstasis of being. That is, a movement toward communion which leads to a transcendence of the boundaries of the self and thus to real freedom. And so he says, ultimately, we only become persons. We only become persons as opposed to just whatever, you know, individuals. We only become persons when this ecstasy of being moves us toward communion with God. And so what I want to counterpose now is the images that you've seen of liturgical life, the liturgical experience in the Byzantine tradition, uh, with what should be should be an extension of that kind of sacramentalized life, but which frequently does not become that. And um, you can read this on your own, but the point I'm, I'm gearing up to is that ultimately, from an authentic Christian point of view, there's no dichotomization between personal life and liturgical life. So take a look at, at this video now, and um, hopefully as you're looking at it, you will be going in the same directions that I'm going to be going with it, because it's really... Okay, sorry. Uh, I finally found the pet aisle. So I start walking down the pet aisle. You know, they're seniors now. I got them when they were two and three, but they're now 12 and 13, so I'm three. And I had to buy a chicken. I checked the date, and it was like a month ahead. So I thought, okay, there was a long So what's going on? You have what ideally should be a sacramental moment. And I use that term advisedly. Uh, some of you are, are familiar with the Ukrainian tradition of having what's called a holy supper on Christmas Eve. You gather in your home and the meal that you eat at your dining room table is called the Holy Supper, Svetavicharya. The whole point, of course, of having that meal at the same table where you eat your corn on the cob, and I don't know, in a couple of weeks, your hamburgers, and then tuna fish sandwiches. The whole point is to engage in this dynamic where you go from the Eucharistic table with a reverberation into the home at the Holy Supper on Christmas Eve, which then reverberates 
into, well, a meal like the one that could have taken place when Miss Smarty Phone decided to ignore this lady, her aunt probably, who needs some love, you know? I mean, I don't enjoy listening to this aunt or grandmother or whatever talking about the price of chicken livers, but we all know that our salvation is found in that kind of bearing of one another's burdens, you know, being attentive, uh, being open, being receptive to this other person. In, in any case, trying to help this person with wherever he or she is at, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, what happens? We've got the, the instruments of amnesia. So what do you do? You're looking for an escape. Now, if you're in touch with the heavenly kingdom, you've got an inscape. You don't need your iPhone to give you these images of ballerinas on the table because, in fact, your mind is filled with images of this copy of the heavenly liturgy. You know? So instead of looking at the, the, the iPhone for, for something that gets you going, you recall what you experienced in church at that other table where um, you know, things are a lot more amazing than ballerinas on the table uh, were taking place. And so I just want to conclude with this, this, this whole um, idea of that interface between that which is most, most sacred and that which tends to be or has become frequently very profane, and say that I think not only does an orthodox, both big O and small O, liturgical tradition have the potential to alter human relationships, to alter that dynamic at that dinner table on, on, on Facebook, but in one sense the proof of the effectiveness of, of that, that dynamic, uh, amazing tradition will be when we see you know, the dinner table changing as a result of what people uh, have experienced close to the holy table in church. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>